and welcome to the National Television Network's live coverage of today's Senate sitting. It is the 22nd of June today, Thursday. Thank you so very much for joining us here at the House of Parliament on Labry Street in Castries. From the Government Information Service, I am Alicia Ali. Don't forget you can catch our broadcast on www.govt.lc and also on the Government of St. Lucia's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Um, we had the House of Assembly sitting on Tuesday of this week where the Appropriations Bill 2017-2018 was passed in the lower house. And that is on the agenda for today's uh, upper house sitting. We are awaiting the arrival of the President of the Senate, Honorable Andy Daniel. Um, when the House last met, there was a lull in the debate on the Appropriations Bill. The bill was actually at its second stage. Uh, as you know, there are three stages to the bill. The second reading uh, is what offers uh, the members an invitation to comment on the bill. And of the people who commented, we had Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Honorable Alan M. Shastney. He presented the bill and uh, he was followed by Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition, Honorable Philip Pierre. We had the member for Shwazel Saltibus, Honorable Bradley Felix, uh, commenting as well as Honorable Dr. Ernest Hiller, the member for Castries South. We had Honorable Dominic Fede, the member for Ancillary Canaries. Honorable Sarah Flood Bover, the member for Castries Central. Honorable Herod Stanislas, the member for Souffre Fosse Jacques. Honorable Guy Joseph, the member for Castries East. And the member for Miku North, a Gail, Honorable Dr. Gail Rigobert. And we also had Honorable Alva Baptiste. Uh, the members who did not give their contribution were Honorable Stevenson King, uh, Honorable Leonard Montout, Honorable Ezekiel Joseph, Honorable Edmund Estefan, Honorable Dr. Kenny D. Anthony, Honorable Moses Javatis, Honorable Sean Edward. And uh, as we look around the chamber here today, we can see that uh, the independent senators uh, in the persons of Senator Dr. Adrian Auger and Senator Mauricio Thomas Francis are ready for today's proceedings as well as uh, I do see the leader of government business in the Senate, uh, the, min the minister in the Ministry of Finance, Honorable Dr. Ubaldus Raymond. We also see uh, Senator the Honorable Mary Isaac. She is here. She's the Minister for Health and Wen Wellness. Honorable Herman Gill Francis. Uh, he is the Minister for Home Affairs, Justice and National Security, uh, Senator Honorable Fortuna Belrose is here. She is the Minister for, in, for Local Government and Culture and Creative Industries. And we see uh, Senator the Honorable Jimmy Henry, who is a Minister in the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives. The opposition senators are not present in the chamber at this moment. And as I said before, we are awaiting the arrival of the President of the Senate, Honorable Andy Daniel. And uh, just to recap, uh, the Prime Minister of St. Lucia presented the Appropriations Bill uh, to the House of Assembly on Tuesday, the 9th of May at 5 p.m. Uh, it was when it was tabled. And in his address, he focused on projects and policies to build a new St. Lucia. He specifically laid out plans for this fiscal year and also for the next four years, which included uh, creating sustainable employment as a focus, social re-engineering, tourism, agriculture, security and justice, energy and climate change. And Prime Minister Honorable Alan M. Chastney said uh, during his summary that uh, these programs and policies are all geared towards stimulating economic activity. The Prime Minister proposed expenditure amounting to somewhere around $1.513 billion. The House uh, resumed on Tuesday to continue that debate. In the estimates of expenditure and revenue for 2017-2018, the Prime Minister did announce a new fuel tax. Uh, during the debate on the Appropriations Bill, Honorable Bradley Felix, um, he did make uh, more comments on that matter in that he says uh, the tax on the new tax on fuel will be specifically geared towards repairing and rehabilitating the island's road network because in his opinion uh, he did not believe that uh, the amount of loans being taken to rehabilitate the island's road network is sustainable we see the chamber doors are opening and the sergeant at arms carrying the mace 
and he is followed by the President of the Senate, Honorable Andy Daniel. And his entrance signals the start of today's proceedings. We now take you to the chamber floor. Let us pray. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone come at all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultations, and grant that we having thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public well-being and prosperity, peace and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Senators. I beg to report that I have received correspondence from the Speaker of the House of Assembly advising that the following motion and bill was passed in the House of Assembly and forwarded to the Senate for its concurrence. Finance Administration Act, Resolution of Parliament authorizing the Minister of Finance to borrow by means of advance, Appropriation Bill 2017-2018. Senators, I have also received communication from the leader of opposition business and has informed me that all of the opposition senators will not be attending today's sitting and asked to be excused. Statement by ministers. Papers to be laid. Honorable Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 28 of 2017, District Court Tariff Costs Rules. Statutory Instrument Number 29 of 2017, Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court sittings of the court amendment rules. Statutory instrument number 30 of 2017, price control amendment number five order.
Statutory Instrument Number 31 of 2017, extra Extradition Designation of Commonwealth Countries Order. Statutory Instrument Number 32 of 2017, Legal Profession Eligibility, Nadia Nicole Yvette Aline Order. Statutory Instrument Number 33 of 2017, Legal Profession Eligibility, Rohana K. Alfia Killen Campbell Order. Statutory Instrument Number 34 of 2017, Finance Administration Act, Resolution of Parliament to Borrow on Lending to the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority, Extension of the Breasting Dolphin Birth. Statutory Instrument Number 35 of 2017, St. Lucia Parliament Proclamation Proroguing Parliament. Statutory Instrument Number 36 of 2017, St. Lucia Parliament Appointment of Session of Parliament. Statutory Instrument Number 37 of 2017, Public Service Commission Disciplinary Pro Proceedings Regulations. Statutory Instrument Number 38 of 2017, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, Larissus V. Fort Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 39 of 2017, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, Larissus V. Fort Vesting Number 2 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 40 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Nikos Touring Services Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 41 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Incentives, Black Pearl Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 42 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Cabot St. Lucia Incorporated Order. Statutory Instrument Number 43 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus Investment, the Hamlet Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 44 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus Investment, Berikic Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 45 of 2017, Tourism in Stimulus and Investment, Freedom Fund Incorporated Order. Statutory Instrument Number 46 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Flora Cottage Villas Limited Order. Estimates of Revenue and Expenditure 2017, 2018, and finally, Mr. President, Economic and Social Review 2016. Motions. Mr. President. Mr. President, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. By the order, by the Honorable Minister, oh sorry, be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow by means of advances, sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sum shall be charged upon and paid out of the consolidated fund. Honorable Senators, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow by means of advances Sums not ex exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sum shall be charged upon and paid out of the consolidated fund. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes are it. The eyes are it. Bills. Leader. 
Honorable Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Appropriation 2017-2018. Appropriation 2017-2018. Honorable Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to move for, for the suspension of standing orders 49-2 to, to enable this bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable Senators, the question is that standing order number 49-2 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Leader of Government Business to proceed with the remaining stages of this bill at this sitting. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. You may proceed, Leader. Mr. President, I beg to move for second reading a bill shortly entitled Appropriation 2017-2018. But Mr. President, before I proceed, I would like to thank the Almighty God for his grace and mercy towards me, my family, the government of St. Lucia, particularly the ministers of government, and of course, the people of St. Lucia. I want to also thank the Honorable Prime Minister for giving me this opportunity to serve in his cabinet where I can serve the people of St. Lucia as senator and minister in the Ministry of Finance. I also want to thank the staff of the Ministry of Finance, Mr. President, for the wonderful work they are doing on behalf of the people of St. Lucia and the government of St. Lucia. I also want to thank Mr. President for the many people who call, text, and meet me in the streets and say to me, I'm praying for you, young man. I'm happy to hear the word young man, but even more so, I'm happy to hear that I have many prayers, prayer warriors around the country, around the world, praying on my behalf. And I believe that when prayers go up, blessings always come down. And of course, I want to thank the cabinet ministers for the wonderful work we are doing on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. We are working as a team, and I like the way that we have taken on the mantle and taken on the task of delivering on behalf of the people or for the people of this country, our lovely St. Lucia. And Mr. President, allow me to also thank my wonderful wife, Dr. Jo Juleta jo Raymond, Joseph Raymond. She has been on my, by my side for the past 25 years and it is only June, 20, June 6th, yes, June 6th, we celebrated our 18th anniversary. I said June 6th, Mr. President. This was a wonderful 17th wedding anniversary, June 6th of 2017. Apart from the love I received from her, the good Lord gave us, or the people of St. Lucia, back into the hands of the United Workers' Party government. And that is the best gift we could have received on June 6th when there was a change of government. 
Mr. President, I also want to thank and con congratulate the public service for the work that they do on behalf of the people of this country. And today or tomorrow is the official celebration of Public Service Day. But I want to take this opportunity to congratulate all members or all um, public servants, civil servants, for working on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. But Mr. President, in that very same breath, I want to regretfully speak on the, I would say, the unfortunate situation we have in the public service, where you have an opposition government party, I should say, is soliciting and encouraging some public servants to leak public documents or government documents in the public domain. And sometimes, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. 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 President, rather, these are confidential documents. I will speak later on the DSH issue. But the public servants, public servants, Mr. President, supposed to serve the public and not any political party. And you have an opposition that is encouraging such behavior in the public service. So, I mean, whereas we have hardworking, hardworking public ser um, servants, we have a few bad ones, I must say. But I want to thank and congratulate all of them as we celebrate, as they celebrate the Public Service Day tomorrow. Mr. President, you see this book here? It's called, it is the Manifesto of the United Workers Party. This is what we told the people of St. Lucia we will do should they elect us on June 6, 2016. This is what we said to them. We will implement or we will be guided by this document. And I must say to you, Mr. President, I was one of the three architects of this manifesto. One of three of the main architects in this manifesto. And my wife behind me was one of the three ones, of, uh, one of the third person, and one other person I will not mention. I'm saying this to say, Mr. President, it was not a document that we just, or it was not just um, information we gathered from nowhere. It is a well-researched document. And we knew exactly what the country needed. We knew. In fact, I started working on this thing over two, two years or a year and a half or two years before, gathering facts, information, understanding what's going on in the country, what's going on in the region and exactly what the country needs. And that's why we coined the phrase, five to stay alive. It has been criticized, but we knew exactly why we said it, why we came with this. Because at the time, Mr. President, the country was suffocating with taxes upon taxes. Now, I meant, it was my intentions, Mr. President, to work with a balloon, and probably I was looking for a red balloon, a red one, yes, a red one. Because, Mr. President, I believe that that balloon had reached its maximum in terms of taxing, taxation, its maximum. And any increase of that balloon, any increase of taxes, the balloon would have exploded. And that's why, Mr. President, a lot of our, the fight to stay alive was one where we would have 
reduce, remove, and give some breathing space in that balloon, breathing space in the economy. And that's exactly what we did, Mr. President. That's exactly what we did. Instead of increasing taxes at the time, we reduced the taxes. We gave tax relief to the people of St. Lucia through the various measures within the fight to stay alive. Not saying, Mr. President, that taxes are not important to run the affairs of the country. It is important. But we believe that if it is not done correctly, you can explode the economy. And that's what we did. We came and we gave a relief. A relief to fight to stay alive. And now we are slowly building the economy. We are slowly building the economy. Not taxes upon taxes and taxes upon taxes and borrowing upon borrowing like the former administration did. But we are strategically implementing our fiscal and fiscal policies to bring life to the economy. So, Mr. President, over the years we have seen many transformative leaders throughout the world. Transformative leaders. And I, remind, and, and I am reminded as a student who got myself educated in the United States in economics, and I will talk about that later on. We always speak of Franklin D. Roosevelt because he was a transformative leader. He became the president at a time when there was the Great Recession. At a time when you had about 25% unemployment in the United States. And everything, the stock market had crashed a period of 10 years. You had a great recession, a great depression. And he came in as a transformative leader and changed the course of the United States of America with bold, bold fiscal, monetary, and economic policies. Mr. President, I'm also reminded of Dr. Man, Man Mohan Singh of India, Prime Minister of India, again around the ninth, late, late 80s, when India's economy was in shambles, he again came with innovative, transformative, out of the box thinking. And of course, Mr. President, we can't forget Barack Obama, who inherited the presidency of the United States when the country, the economy, was experiencing a great recession. And again, Mr. President, this president had to undertake bold, transformative, out-of-the-box, innovative decisions. And we know what the result is today. And Mr. President, we are here, right here in St. Lucia. We have a leader whom I believe when history is written, he will go down in the annals of transformative leaders in St. Lucia. Because, Mr. President, his policies and his decisions are transformative, they are innovative, 
They are out of the box. We are different. We cannot and we should not walk the very same path that the last administration walked. It was a path of destruction. It was a path that would have led us into the deepest ocean, maybe the Red Sea. But Mr. President, the people of the country of St. Lucia elected us to change the course of this country. And that's exactly what we will do. Mr. President, I am not saying the journey will be easy because I'm reminded, Mr. President, that mountains are not coated in sugar. We will get there. We will be bruised. We will be criticized, Mr. President. There will be walkouts, Mr. President. There will be demonstrations, protests. There will be market step meetings. There will be lies, propaganda. There will be fake news, Mr. President. But we will not be distracted. We will not be distracted. And we will not apologize for being different. Because this difference, Mr. President, will bring change and a new St. Lucia. Right. Mr. President, let me just read to you just a little quote from Dr. Manhoma, Man Mohan Singh, budget speech of 1991, just very brief. He says, I do not minimize the difficulties that lie ahead on the long and arduous journey on which we have embarked. But as Victor Hugo once said, no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. Our time has come. The time has come when we will build a new St. Lucia. Mr. President, what is the impetus? What is the force? What is the rising agent? What is the drive behind this new St. Lucia? It is embedded in the ideology the philosophy of the United Workers Party. That's the driving force. It is the driving force. Because the driving force of the last administration and the Labour Party is one of building a welfare state. That's the impetus. That is the driving force. That's what drives them. Building a welfare state. Everything that they do, it's about building a group of people that will stretch their hands to them and call them master, boss man. Give me a break, give me a job, give me a contract. That's what they want. They claim they love the poor. They claim they love the poor. Yes, they do. But they like the poor to be in poverty. They love the poor, but they love even more when the poor is in poverty. Because when you build a welfare state, you are perpetuating a cycle of poverty. And that's why, Mr. President, they are very upset, very upset, when you touch programs like NICE. Because they knew or they know very well why you have such programs. 
people getting paycheck upon paycheck, handouts upon handouts, and just remaining on the same or even below where they were. None of these individuals who are on a nice program can go to a bank and ask for a loan to send the kids to school or to buy a piece of land or to, to get a piece of property. None of them. The bank will not honor that. Is that fair for the people of this country who elect a government to improve their lives? Is that fair? So the, the, ideo the ideology of the United Workers Party, Mr. President, is different. We believe in empowering people. We believe, Mr. President, that we're supposed to create the enabling environment, give the supportive environment to improve the lives of individuals. And that's why we have a private sector approach and focus. Relieve the pressure of government and put it in the hands of the private sector. And when I speak of the private sector, I speak of individuals, entrepreneurs, people who don't have to go and cut grass, but they can what? Own a business, a small business, empowerment. But this, was, this is different. What we're doing here is different from what they used to do. I said, we, we are innovative, we are different, and we are not apologizing for being different. Not for one minute we will apologize for being different, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, our broad policies, our policies are geared towards three major things here. That of economic growth, that of debt sustainability, and that of job creation. I said job creation. I said job creation. It's not buying jobs, but creating jobs. It's not government borrowing money and putting people into offices and all everywhere else and say that they have created jobs. That's not job creation. You're buying jobs at the expense of the public because you're borrowing the funds to pay salaries. Well, Mr. President, we have kept a nice program and we have changed it a little. We have tweaked it. We have put it in such a way that people will be empowered through the various training programs that we have started. These very same people who have been trained after a year or two they don't have to depend on government for the job. They can go elsewhere. In fact, there are some short-term training programs. Immediately after the training, they are getting jobs. It's not, a, it's not a situation, Mr. President, where one year comes and you are the mercy of the government as to whether or not your contract could be extended or renewed. And that's how they want you, you know. That's how they want you. The other side here, that's how they want you. They want you to, shake, to keep shaking in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your boots, in your shoes, in your whatever it is. Shaking. And you see them as, you know, they want, to, they want you to see them as their master. I remember clearly, big meeting up in Dumpelet Auditorium. You remember that? When the former prime minister, bunch of nice workers, I wasn't here, I saw it on television. Is it comprehensive? Yeah, well, it's someone one of the schools. And they are waiting. Mon Dieu, mon hope, mon hand, contract, my renew. That's how they want you. They want you at their knees. That's how they want you. And then come, and in, you know, and coming through the crowd was the Savior coming. The Savior coming. And then 
Well, I'm not too sure uh, if you will be able to continue the nice program. I'm not too sure. But I will see what we can do. We will see what we can do. He knew very well he could be renewed. He knew that. What he wanted, when it, when it is renewed, he will say, Merci, Kenny Anthony. That's how they want you. We don't want that in, in this country. It's a different thinking altogether. Different thinking. Mr. President, speaking of the private sector, The biggest scare that the opposition has is what we refer to as the DSH. They have nightmares on that. Nightmares. That's why they're busy. Busy bodies. Parading all television stations, all radio stations, north and south. They come by pairs, black and white. Come by pairs. They come by twos. Marches. DSH. DSH. Mr. President. I remember in economic development class. I remember. In when you are developing a city. You always try to look for an industry that will attract people, attract businesses, attract commerce. Always try to do that. And we see what happened. We have seen what happened in Cap Street, the harbor. We have seen what happened in the north, Rodney Bay. Strategic thinking strategic planning. We have an international airport in Freeport, an international airport. We have a deep harbor in Freeport. What has these two entities attracted? What have they attracted? What have they brought to the Freeport? Absolutely nothing. You have people living in the South Chosel. How much they pay for transportation? Some people, eight fifty. About that, about eight fifty. Let's put nine dollars. So eighteen dollars every day. Eighteen dollars every day for five days a week. And sometimes the household, not only one person living, not only one person in the household actually transport themselves to Castries. Maybe three or four people. So you have a job here in Castries making a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Almost have that money in the transportation. So you have a lot of working poor people in the south, working poor. They are working with the poor. So what is wrong with Beaufort? Why hasn't there been any serious development in Beaufort? And when I speak of Viewport, Mr. Mr. President, I speak also of the surrounding communities. I include Denry and Miku, Chozel Labry. Dead, dead, dead. I remember it was okay back then when we had the bananas because the bananas farmers were doing very well. The families were doing very well. In fact, the banana farmers used to support a lot of the, the commerce in Viewport. A lot of the commerce. But as you know, Mr. President, there was a transition. There was a structural change in the economy when the Labour Party came in 97. We moved from an, what, an agricultural-based economy to that of a service-type economy, more specifically tourism. And what happened to the farmers? What happened to the farming communities, Mr. Mr. President? What happened? Poverty. 
poverty. And this had a direct impact on the commerce that used to take place in Freeport because the farmers of the South, Miku, Denry, and other places, they used to support the businesses in the South, in Freeport. I'm speaking here of strategic planning. There wasn't any, no thought was given when we move and we change the economy from that of an agricultural base to a tourism base. Absolutely no thought. So what happened, Mr. President? What happened? What did we see? There was a mass rural urban migration a mass, the children of farmers and even farmers themselves. In fact, just this morning I saw a farmer growing up in, in Millet. He's a taxi driver now. Mass migration from the rural areas to the urban centers, castries and the surrounding areas. And what we saw immediately, Mr. President, upsurge in crime. And you had what? High unemployment especially in the cash with basin. So the poor, I mean the, the rural areas, the farming communities now have become poor and cash with now has become a haven for crime, criminal activity. No strategic planning, absolutely none. None at all. And what we saw here in the cash with basin alone we had, the government had more pressure on their backs now because they had to ensure that public facilities are available for an expanded population. So more schools, more, more maintenance on roads, some, some places more roads. Pressure. And because the pressure is now in the Castries Basin, the other areas got neglected. And that's why, Mr. President, I am saying to you that the DSH is not just a project, but it is a marvelous project. It's a marvelous project. It will change the course of things and the way and the livelihood of people in this country for a very long time. And that is what the opposition are afraid of. They're afraid of that. And that's why, I mean, it is so ridiculous, you know. You have a private sector, a, a private investor, or investor rather, a foreign investor. He had a negotiations with the government for 15 months thereabout. No one knew anything about it. Absolutely nothing. Now, it's okay. Because in the agreement, you have what? Confidentiality clause. You should not be discussing a project that is still in negotiations in the public. That's okay. But now, it's not okay for them. They want us to say everything in the, in the, in the, um, in the uh, agreement. What's the objective? What do you think the objective is? The objective now is to stall the project. But let me tell you something here. When people are hungry, when people need jobs, when people have their families to feed, when people have their kids to send to school, when people have their mortgages to pay, they will not allow an opposition to stop them. The people of the South will revolt against the opposition because the opposition is about taking away the bread, the bread from the mouths. That's what it is. We are here to create jobs, and that is what we will do. We are not into the empty mantra of jobs, jobs, jobs. You remember that? Jobs, jobs, jobs. We are not into empty promises, empty mantras. We will deliver. And the opposition will not prevent the government from delivering. That's why we don't pay them attention. We don't pay them attention. We just, you know, 
as I said to my Prime Minister and the, my, my, my colleagues, you know, let them talk and let, let the brick and mortar go up. Let the BRC and the cement and what else? Quarry race. To the bad guy. Let, let us build and shut them up. They will not prevent it. It will not be prevented. We will transform the South and we will transform the lives of the people of St. Lucia. And guess what? We do not apologize for doing that. We don't apologize. All the other things we can discuss, we can have a discussion. We are still in negotiation. Mischievous opposition. Mischievous opposition. Very mischievous. Trying to discourage foreign investors from coming to this country to invest. Even when they know. <laughs> it's quite interesting, you know. Very, very interesting. In the previous in the previous opposition line, they tried the very same thing. The prime minister or the leader of the opposition then said, he's, he was threatening to what? To write to investors not to come to St. Lucia. Is that a responsible opposition leader? Or pri I'll say prime minister. Is that a responsible person? Does he like St. Lucians? Does he like St. Lucia? To say that you're discouraging, you want to discourage investors from coming to St. Lucia? That sounds like selfishness to me. That sounds like vindictiveness to me. Yeah, yeah. They, like the word, they like to use that word, right? Vindictiveness. Yeah. They are victimizing the people of St. Lucia. When you are trying to chase away investors, it's about victimizing the people of St. Lucia. That's what it is. That's what it is. And guess what? They want the people of St. Lucia to cry. Cry. They like to cry. That's what they, that's what they say, right? And Mr. President, we have serious business we want to take in this country. Very serious business. And nothing. The people of this country gave us a mandate, and we will fulfill this mandate. Mr. President, I turn to one of the areas that we are placing lots of emphasis and focus on as a government, and more specifically within the Ministry of Finance, is that of debt management. Just going back six years ago, just going back six years ago, the interest on our debt was only about $100 million, just below $100 million. When, the, when the, the last administration left, it was close to $180 million in interest payments alone. Interest payments alone. In four or five years, the interest payments alone moved up or climbed by $80 million. You see, that's the modus operandi of a St. Lucia Labour Party government. They cannot grow the economy. They have not demonstrated that they have what it takes to grow the economy. We were the worst performing economy in the OECS for the last five years under the last administration. Three years of negative growth, negative growth, three years, consecutive years. And this was during a period of prosperity when our neighboring economies were doing well. No financial crisis, no oil crisis, no disturbances in the financial market. And yet still, the last administration failed to grow this, this economy. And they left us with 25% unemployment rate. 25% left us with a youth unemployment of close to 45% and a level of unsustainable debt. That's what they left us. Mr. President, not only that, in terms of debt, when the last administration of the United Workers Party left government, when you look at the structure of our debt portfolio, the debt portfolio, we had more long-term instruments than short-term. What do I mean by that? 
shorter term instruments, debt instruments, carry higher what? Higher interest rates. And it puts the country at higher risk. And more pressure on your cash flow. Because yes, the country receives revenue, but the revenue has to be turned into paying the debt down. And of course, the reverse is true. With longer term instruments, you have short, you have lower interest rates, and of course, a longer term to pay. That's what they inherited in 2011. As we currently speak, Mr. President, the reverse has happened. Almost half of our debt, almost half of our debt instruments is in short term. Short term. High risk, high roll over risk. And Mr. President, the last administration actually failed so miserably to grow the economy. Because in growing the economy, Mr. President, in simple terms, you are creating more economic activities, Mr. President, and the government in turn should increase their revenues. But it never happened. Never happened. So the only option they had was to borrow more money. The only option. And Mr. President, something happened during the last administration. The Finance Act gives you guidelines or stipulation as to the level of short-term instruments, debt instruments you can borrow as a government. It used to be 30% of the previous year's recurrent revenue. 30% of the previous year's recurrent revenue. You know what they did? They amended that section of the act and they made it 50%. It was amended. But Mr. President, when we took office in June of last year, we saw something happening in the market financial markets, the regional markets, financial markets, the RGSM, RGSM. There was a rush, a rush for our bonds. A rush, I say a rush. And why was there a rush? Because there was a level of confidence in the new government. Because they had, you see, let me tell you something here. Don't think that regional bodies, financial institutions don't pay attention to these things. I know that very well. I know that. And that's the reason why I was part of this. That's the reason why. That's the reason. They paid attention. And I mean immediately they came rushing to our doors and they were providing longer term, term bonds. That's a sign of what? Confidence. And we have to tell them, look, Enough. I think, if I recall, the last budget had like $97 million for bonds. We got like 125 there about. We could have stopped in it. So enough, 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 enough. Because of the thinking, the thinking of this new administration, we are seeing signs of recovery. Slow signs, but encouraging. So the Ministry of Finance has un, has, is working very hard to see how we can restructure our debt or to restructure the portfolio of our debt. And we have engaged a number of um, uh, bodies, I should say, a number of, um, for example, we have spoken to a company named White Oak that have done great job, a great job in, in, in Grenada, St. Kitts. And, and Jamaica, and, um, and if you look at the debt portfolio of, 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 of these three countries, they are doing great. And there's no risk, no risk in this. No reputational risk in this thing here, okay? And just last week or week before, we have engaged another company called, um, they are interested in buying back our bonds and at a lower, at a discount rate, of course, discount interest rate. And the savings from that will be used to to conserve our marine life. 
and we have engaged the various um, ministries, departments, ministry of, of, of um, ministry of, of, of fisheries, the Department of Fisheries, the Department of Agriculture, and they are very excited of a win-win situation. They are buying back the bonds at a lower interest rate. The savings from that bond will be used over a period of time to conserve our marine life. So we are busy. We are busy. You know, they are shocked. They are bamboozed. <laughs> things, things have been done differently. You pa, you pa bit wakes up. <laughs> they are confused. All they have to do is come to us and ask, you know, uh, come, uh, uh, let me know. come ask. We will tell you what we're doing. Not going out there making noise and a lot of noise. You know, creating a lot of chaos, a lot of anarchy, uh, 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 an atmosphere of uh, fear. You know, you know, making noise among themselves. But you know, the members on this side, we are focused, aren't we? We are focused. We are not perturbed. We are not disturbed. The people of this country gave us a mandate, and we will fulfill that mandate. So the opposition can make all kinds of noise they want. They can walk out how they want. But we will do what we have to do for the people of this country. Mr. President, another area we are focusing on. May I ask you how, many, how much more time I have, Mr. President? You have 16 minutes left. 16? Yes, sir. OK, that should be, should be sufficient. If not, I'll ask my colleague for additional time. Mr. President, we're also focusing on um, our tax system, the tax administration. We're working hard with the, with the, with the um, Department of, of Inner Revenue to see how we can simplify the system and the administration of taxes in this country. Because we want a, a tax system administration that is very simplistic, but yet still efficient. And we believe that what we have currently is not simplistic and it's very, very inefficient. So we are working on that, Mr. President. If I had more time, I'll give you more detail as to what exactly we're doing, but I'll move on. Now, I'm sure probably, Mr. President, you have heard it from this side and on the airwaves by the opposition. And on the platforms. Oh, we avoided going to the IMF. <laughs> we avoided the IMF. We avoided the IMF. <laughs> but they have never said to, you, to us, the people of this country, what did they do to avoid going to the IMF? <laughs> you know, you can say anything, you know. I realize in, in institution politics, you, you can say anything. And you, you'll hear, you'll hear the, 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 the supporters, yay, yay to what? What did you do to avoid going to the IMF? In fact, you should have gone to the IMF, or the IMF should come to you because of the state you left this country. The worst performing economy in the OECS, the highest level and perhaps the highest level of unemployment in the OECS. Now, if they, had, if they had probably put on the secret 5% salary cut, maybe they would have said, boy, we had to do that to avoid the IMF coming here. But this senator caught them as a CSA president. Obusheyo. I mean, you're going as far as trying to secretly put in the budget a 5% cut. That's desperation. That's desperation. It shows that you had exhausted all avenues of taxation. So I'll tell you what volé. Volé in the public. Because you have to come. You see, certain things can be done in secret. 
certain agreements could be, can be signed in secret. Certain agreements could be done by one person. But when you have the appropriations bill, you must come to cabinet, you must come to parliament. And that's where this iron lady caught them. So what the big thing about we avoided, we avoid going to the IMF. That's a lie. If any country had to be in the hands of the IMF or St. Lucia, the worst performing ever. I talk about we avoided going to the IMF. Ask them what they did. Ask them. This is our fair IMF five this year. Absolutely nonsense. Another, another little snippet they put out there. We had a, a very good primary surplus. We left a good economy, primary surplus. Absolutely nonsense. I don't want to be too technical here. But the primary surplus, Mr. President, if you are not able to borrow the amount of money you wanted to borrow for capital expenses, or you uh, have not been able to implement your capital project, it will affect your, 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 your primary surplus. It will. And this government, they could not have actually borrowed the amount of money they wanted to borrow in the financial market. So that affected the implementation of the capital project. So what they actually budgeted for, they actually spend way below that amount because they are not able to. To expend anything because no monies were actually were not able to be borrowed on the financial market. Well, I wouldn't say no, but very little because they had lost faith. The regional, the regional body had lost faith in this government. So when you talk about primary surplus, and a lot by Yokadi, Mr. President. And another thing they was they, they kept they kept saying is that hey, we have a large budget deficit. This, among all this thing here, the most important page or the most significant page here is Roman numeral, numeral three. Summary. And they will say to you, Mr. President, that, what class is mine? They will say to you that we are borrowing or we intend to borrow $346.5 million. The highest ever, the highest ever. Just remember, Mr. President, this is the very first time we are presenting a budget. This is our new budget. So we are just transitioning from one new government to another. So there are lots of carryover. A lot of carryovers, Mr. President, a lot of it. A lot of the debt and the payables of the last administration. It's now on the backs of this new administration. And not only that, Mr. President, added to that, we have our own initiatives to move forward with. So almost naturally, you will have a budget deficit. But Mr. President, it is not the worst we ever had. If you go back to 1415, if I'm right, 1415. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, actually, our budget, our current budget here, 1718, it is 345. No, the financing amount is 345 million. And in 1516, that was about three or four years they were in government, they had a budget deficit. They had a financing requirement of $346 million and a budget deficit, deficit of $227 million. I am talking about two different periods, you know. As a new government, you come in, yes, naturally you'll have some serious budget deficits. But over the years, you'll be able to stabilize your finances, right? Your, your, your borrowing. 
But in the third, fourth year, that's when they came out with the highest level of budget deficit and the highest level of, of borrowing. Talk about performance. Talk about performance. Every aspect, when you look at every aspect of the social and economic review, a performance of the last administration, it's just, oh my goodness, I'm looking for a word for it. This one is not good enough. It's not good enough. So Mr. President, I am very, very, very hopeful. I am very, very, very excited that we are on the right track. But before I leave, Mr. President, I know that in the policy statement of the Prime Minister that he made mention of reviewing some statutory bodies and assessing their performances to see whether or not the government will privatize them or restructure them. And that is not new, you know, Mr. President. It's not new. I know, I know exactly what's inside of here. It's not new. Look at this, Mr. President. The Manifesto of the United Workers Party 2016, on page 10, it says here to achieve this goal, well, we said that we will assess the efficiency of government statutory bodies and where applicable, eliminate or merge them. We said it here, page 10 of the manifesto. I'll read it again. We said that we will assess the efficiency of government statutory bodies and where, where applicable, eliminate or merge them. We said it there. We said it. And guess what? Guess who else said it? About 20 years ago. Guess who else? Who said it? The former prime minister in his 1998-99 budget speech. He did so. He said it. I was so happy when I stumbled upon this book in my office. So happy. Remember where I said, wow. So the very same thing he said he would do, he never did it. Now we said we will do it, and they're crying foul. I'll read it, Mr. President. Page 17, it says, In respect of privatization, government policy is guided by three major... Honorable Leader of Government Business, you have five minutes left. Yes, Mr. President. In respect of privatization, government's policy is guided by three major pri priorities. I'll just read one. The first priority is to withdraw from areas of commercial activity in which its presence is no longer needed and which are better managed by private sector interests. Who said that? Kennedy Anthony said that. The very same thing he said about um, having Viewport as the new frontier. I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a back tier. Right now, not front, it's a back. Leader of Government Business, can you identify this? This is the 1989-99 budget speech by the Honorable Dr. Kennedy Anthony, Prime Minister of St. Lucia and Minister of Finance, page 17. I continue, Mr. President. It says, the long-term objective here is to create space for new dynamic businesses to emerge and flourish. Where this proves feasible, government may divest altogether to retain a minimum equity position while passing management, operational control, and, ma and majority ownership into more efficient private hands. Mr. President, he didn't do it. We're going to do it for him. We're going to do it for him. Mr. President, I had not even seen this before when I entered this here. What I did, I did my research. And almost all IMF reports speak about these statutory bodies, the inefficiencies of them. Almost all. CDB reports likewise. And even without a report, the common man will see, even the common man will see that our statutory bodies are most <coughs> of them are inefficient. So we decide to undertake this assessment and the government will do what it has to do for the interest 
of the people of this country. So, Mr. President, I want to thank you again for your time. I want to thank the people, the Prime Minister, for giving me this opportunity to serve in his cabinet. I want to thank the Ministry of Finance or the Department for fin of Finance for the marvel marvelous work they are doing. And of course, I want to thank the Almighty God for the strength, the wisdom, the fortitude, his grace, his love, his mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness that guide me and keeps me every moment and every single day. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable Senators, the question is that the appropriation 2017-2018 bill be read a second time. Honorable Deputy President of the Senate. Mr. President, honorable members, I am obliged for the opportunity to share my perspective on the appropriation bill for the fiscal year 2017-2018, tabled in this honorable house by the distinguished leader of government business. Mr. President, I would like to start off by thanking the Almighty for blessing us with life and getting us here safely today to attend to the business of the people of St. Lucia. Mr. President, this being my maiden budget address, or budget debate if you like, I must state that this is an opportunity which I value profoundly and would like to take this opportunity to once again express how appreciative I am for the opportunity to represent the interest of the nation. Mr. President, as you are aware, the role of an independent senator is to bring perspectives which are not politically color-coded, but rather perspectives that are of national interest. Of course, I must say or mention that that this being my maiden address, my maiden contribution to the debate, and I believe the position is the same for all of us in this room, I would have been delighted to have had our other colleagues here today to get their perspectives and their contribution to the debate. But I shall comment on that a little later in my presentation. Ms. Mr. President, I think it is opportune for me to start my contribution by quoting from this year's throne speech, which was eloquently delivered by Her Excellency, the Governor General, and I quote, real growth and development are distinguished by a government's ability to meet the current needs of its people and industries without compromising the opportunity for future generations to meet their needs. 
I will also quote from the Prime Minister's budget address, which states, and I quote, we want to build a St. Lucia which instills pride, a place where businesses can flourish, where people can get jobs, not handouts, where people feel secure, care for each other, can access educational opportunities, receive quality health services, and enjoy a comfortable standard of living without imposing a burden on future generations." Unquote. Senator, not wanting to interrupt, um, when you're quoting, can you please identify the page so that we can all follow you? That's it. Thank you. I shall be so guided for the future, Mr. President. Thanks for your guidance. Mr. President, as we all know too well, and indeed this fact was highlighted in the budget address, St. Lucia's profile is characterized in the main by consecutive years of marginal growth, low productivity, high unemployment, a high level of public debt and fiscal deficit, lack of competitiveness and high cost of doing business, escalation in the level of crime. Suffice it to say, Mr. President, that the prevailing socioeconomic fundamentals of our country are a source of grave concern to many of our citizens. You only have to listen to the daily screams via the social media, radio and television talk shows, one-on-one -on -one on group discussions, and while I mentioned talk shows, there's a popular one that comes on, I believe, every day. And I believe on two occasions, the people are invited to express their views on what makes them mad. So Mr. President, if you want to get a perspective on what the people are feeling, what makes you mad is, of course, a talk show that one needs to listen to. And of course, if there is any doubt about the situation, we just need to listen to the lyrics of some of this year's Calypsos. I've been listening to them, and of course, what is coming through there in the social commentaries are expressions of concern from our citizens. And when Calypsonians sing, I believe they are singing and representing the views of a wide cross-section of the society. Mr. President, I will attempt to address each element, starting with the issue of marginal growth. According to the Social and Economic Review of 2016, on the page Roman numeral six, St. Lucia recorded real GDP of 9% in 2016, following a revised growth of 1.9% in 2015. This, we were told, was influenced by contraction in the dominant tourism sector. We were told further, Mr. President, that the economy has been growing at an average rate of only 1.3% in the last 10 years. Comparatively, and I believe uh, the leader of government business made mention of it, comparatively, global output was 3.1% in 2016, and when compared to our peers in the OECS, St. Lucia recorded the lowest level of GDP. And when we talk about lowest level of GDP, we have to put that in the context of where St. Lucia came from. In my former life, I had the pleasure I had a great sense of pride when I sat at regional conferences representing St. Lucia and speaking in terms of St. Lucia's performance, St. Lucia's profile vis-a-vis -vis the other islands in the OECA. St. Lucia was the leader, Mr. President. St. Lucia was the leader. Mr. President, it is not a good place to be. 
We experience declines in our main tourism sector, both in terms of visitor arrivals and expenditure by 7.3% and 4.8% respectively. And the financial and monetary sectors also declined. Uh, according to the, the same report, the Social and Economic Review Report, the manufacturing, agricultural, and construction sectors achieved growth of 60%, 4% and a 7.2% respectively. And Mr. President, I am still quoting from Roman numeral six for the benefit of honorable members. We have been fed with a buffet of strategies aimed at achieving sustainable economic growth over the next four years. Mr. President, I think it is opportune for us to look at the issue of marginal growth from the perspective of the tourism sector. And we will look at that from the perspective of other sectors as well. In the area of tourism, we have been told that a number of significant new hotel development projects are in the pipeline, which will boost economic activity Growth in room stock is projected to increase to 2,000 in the next four years. This sounds very, very heartening given where we are in terms of our fiscal position as a country. Mr. President, also the concept of village tourism, in my view, if implemented effectively, and I say effectively because a lot of the time I think uh, my, the leader of government business has accused me of loving analysis. But when I talk about effectiveness, I am thinking that you know, there, there would be a need to effectively analyze this particular thrust to ensure that it, and it lands well and that we maximize the benefits in terms of creating value for the country. So the concept of village tourism implemented effectively is one that can generate significant benefits to some of the economically deprived villages. We've been told that eight villages have been targeted under that concept. Greater economic output can be generated from this in the industry and in, the devel and in developing the village tourism com concept. I propose that the government should conduct an in-depth assessment of what the visitors are looking for when they visit our shores and determine what gaps that exist and how these gaps can be filled. Why do I say so? Based on my interactions with some of the visitors to the island, you know, I get remarks like there's not enough locally produced crafts, locally produced souvenirs to be purchased. There is not enough nightlife in the villages other than the activities at the hotels. So you get those com comments and several others that possibly later on I can highlight. Mr. President, we have been told that visitor expenditure declined. Do we know and, and understand, like I ask, you know, wh why are the visitors not spending? To what extent are we reviewing and analyzing the exit surveys and visitor online reviews to determine those needs? I do know that our, in our ports of entry, there are exit surveys that are done when visitors leave the island. There are surveys that are done at the hotels as well to test the level of satisfaction with St. Lucia as a product and with, of course, the hotel, you know, where they reside while they're on vacation. There are also reviews that are being provided via the social media, reviews that are being provided via the booking sites. And these reviews provide adequate information which, if analyzed properly, we can determine what are the gaps that we need to fill? 
There are opportunities for us to generate increased output, output from the sector if we focus on repackaging our tourism offer as a country. So I am proposing that we focus, or the government focuses, on developing the arts and crafts sector by providing support, technical support, and financial resources to our artisans, etc., such that they can develop the products which the, the visitors desire to purchase. Backward and forward linkages between tourism, agriculture, manufacturing, and construction was mentioned in the Prime Minister's budget address. Mr. President, for as long as I can remember in my adult life, we have been talking about linkages. We have been talking about linking agriculture to tourism. But, however, we have not done a good job in terms of implementing what I believe is a very key strategy. We have not been able to walk the talk. We have not been able to add, to add teeth, if you like, to such an important endeavor. Another area I think we need to be looking at is the incentive regime to hotels, which would ensure that such linkage can be realized. Mr. President, I'm thinking, what is wrong with developing an incentive regime for the hospitality sector that will ensure that they commit, you know, hotels, on the island, especially the large ones, commit to purchasing produce from local suppliers to be able to benefit from that suite of incentives. In terms of, the, of agriculture, Mr. President, again, we're still talking about marginal growth. There is a diversification thrust. And, of course, that diversification thrust has been spoken about for a very, very long time. I think we have made some progress, but we still have a long way to go. So I would propose that we provide technical support towards this thrust and possibly develop some kind of guarantee, funding guarantee through possibly Development Bank or other financial vehicles that can provide support to farmers who want to get involved in the whole diversification trust. We need to also source export markets regionally and internationally, especially for the non-traditional -tra crops. Mr. President, again, I often wonder why do we not, or why haven't we leveraged on the St. Lucian and Caribbean diaspora in Canada, in the UK, in the USA, to support that export thrust. I would like to use Jamaica as an example. I was very heartened when I visited Canada some time ago and went into a supermarket. And I was able to purchase lots of agricultural produce that was imported out of Jamaica. And Jamaicans were flocking to that particular supermarket just to have the benefit of consuming produce that came from their country. I believe we can try to do that. We can try to add uh, tremendous value in implementing such a strategy. Like I said, we will not only benefit from the St. Lucian diaspora, but of course, we have a huge Caribbean diaspora that will be able to support our our goods. So Mr. Mini Head of Government Business, I would like you to take note of this important, what I consider a very important strategy. The government has also proposed that through the Youth Agri-Enterprise Facilitation Program, 150 young persons will be recruited as agricultural entrepreneurs. And it is, I hope, that this first will materialize as I believe it is a great idea. It is an idea that would, if successful, will generate additional 
employment for our young people, as well as inspire others who may, for various reasons, choose to shy away from the agricultural sector. So I do truly hope that this trust comes to fruition. <clears throat> Mr. President, let's look at the monetary and financial sector. As I said earlier, there was decline in that particular subsector. And again, if I may quote from the 2016 Social and Economic Review Report, on page 57, on the domestic credit, and I quote, in keeping with the weak economic growth and heightened levels of risk aversion in the commercial banking system, the stock of domestic credit continued to fall for the third consecutive year. The decline was driven by 5% fall in the stock of private sector credit and lower levels of net credit to central government, unquote. Mr. President, page 58 of that report at caption, commercial bank performance, also states, and I quote, continued weakness in economic activity and restructuring of non-productive loans continue to impact commercial bank performance. According to that report, non-performing loans in the banking sector as at the end of 2016, stood at 562.9 million EC dollars. Mr. President, you may not be aware, but a significant quantum of this amount represents loans secured by mortgages. Mr. President, honorable members, there is a direct correlation between the high levels of NPL within the banking system and, of course, the heightened risk aversion by commercial banks. Such high level of delinquency in the banking system is exacerbated by the antiquated foreclosure laws which hinder the bank's ability to recover delinquent assets through the court system. Needless to say, Mr. President, that this situation continues to threaten the viability of the local banking sector. Several years of prolonged and proactive advocacy to get successive governments to reform the prevailing draconian legislation to make it more bank friendly have been futile, Mr. President, much to my pain and anguish, and that of the banking community as well as other stakeholders in the community who understand the implications. Mr. President, reformation of such law will ensure disposal of toxic assets, which in turn will maximize efficiency in the banking sector. This is a matter of critical import, as it does not only affect the safety of depositors' funds, profitability of banks, and increased lending appetite is also affected. Mr. President, permit me to just take a little time to explain for the benefit of the wider St. Lucian public how the bank operates. So when I talk about risk to depositors, risk to depositors must be viewed from the perspective that banks do not carry stock. Banks do not own the stock that it employs. And when I, say, when I say stock, I am talking about the deposits which the bank employs to lend, to generate profits, is owned by the depositors. Therefore, we must understand, Mr. President, and the public must understand, and the government must understand, that when a decision is taken not to address the issue with foreclosure legislation and we end up with such large level of non-productive loan, it is threatening the stability of the banking system. And by extension, it is threatening to derail persons who have earned you know, their life savings and have placed their savings in the banking system for wet days. 
This is a matter of critical import as it does not only affect the, safe, the, the safety of depositors' funds, like I said, profitability of banks are under threat. And when I talk about profitability, Ms. For those of us who have been monitoring the performance of the banking sector, we will realize that the bottom line of all, mostly all the banks have been under tremendous pressure. Those banks that have not recorded losses, they have recorded re very much reduced profits. And that is a threat as well because they are shareholders that are requiring value and of course, this situation is not helping in the context that we describe. It would also mean that the capital structure of banks will be strengthened and there will be greater opportunity for private sector expansion through access to more flexible bank products and services at more enhanced costs to the clients. Mr. President, by virtue of the fact that the banks are not able to realize profits and the banks cannot re recover those non-productive loans, they have to resort to charging higher fees to the consumers. They have to resort to charging higher rates of interest. And they have to resort to tightening the lending policies such that when that happens, we cannot expand the economy as we should, because as we all know, banks play a very critical role in the development of any country by virtue of the services that they offer. Mr. President, as I was hoping that the appropriation bill would have made some mention of the introduction of a bill in this honorable house to address this important issue. I, if my memory serves me right, I did raise that issue some time ago and I was promised by the leader of government business that this particular matter was on the cards and in short order, this matter would come before the House. Mr. President, it's almost a year since we are here, and we are yet to see the fruits of that promise. So we are waiting because we believe that this is a situation that must be addressed speedily. But Mr. President, why has there been delays or non-responsiveness to this important issue? I believe it is so because there is not the political will to address the issue. Like I said, su successive governments have been approached and still we have not resolved the issue. There isn't the political will, I believe. We have heard arguments about a concern that if the legislation is changed, the banks might indiscriminately repossess people's properties. The, I don't believe that this is a fair statement, Mr. President. I wish to make two points on that argument. St. Lucia is the only territory in the region with such a foreclosure legislation. All the other territories have legislation that is more user-friendly, more bank-friendly, and we have never had a case where banks have exhibited discrimination or unreasonableness in dealing with this particular matter. I would like to say that based on my experience and knowledge, the banking sector has a very significant social conscience and exhaust all avenues in dealing with customers and take into consideration all critical factors in determining the way forward in dealing with a particular debt. So I do not believe that argument holds water. The second thing is that I believe there is the lack of political will is sort of myopic, if you like, since it appears that there is no regard for the safety of the depositors' funds, like I said, which are at risk. For the banking sector to be stable, the depositors' funds must be safe. And of course, banks must have the wherewithal to be able to expand such that they can provide the requisite support for the social and economic development of the country. Mr. President, as I already mentioned, the financial sector will help or hinder a nation's economy. 
A stable financial system provides an environment that is conducive to economic activity and growth. Just to borrow a very apt quote from page 62 of the Social and Economic Review Report, I quote, having credit opportunity is a means of generating financial power, unquote. So if therefore we are implementing economic and social programs in this fiscal year and we want to attain financial power, we want to attain fiscal stability, we want to attain sustainable uh, develop socioeconomic development, we need to address this important need. Mr. President, let me hasten to talk about the manufacturing sector. The report on page 28 states that there are five impediments to growth in the manufacturing sector, namely high cost of utilities and upfront payment on VAT, an aversion to some manufacturers to take advantage of export opportunities, use of low level of technology, lack of standard certification, high dependence on importation of raw materials and packaging and inadequate technological skills and low productivity among workers. Mr. President, I am heartened that there is a proposal by the Minister of Finance for the development of a new tax regime to effectively tackle the issue surrounding VAT. However, the areas, the other areas are equally important and I propose that the government goes a step further to provide additional support to that important sector in order to maximize their contribution to GDP. There, is, there are tremendous untapped potential in agri-processing, and this can be maximized through the linkages with the agricultural and tourism sector that I mentioned earlier. Mr. President, um, as we might be aware, hotel sector consume tremendous amounts of products such as coconut cream, juices, aromatic oils for massages, desserts. And we have an abundance of fruits and vegetables that can be pro processed to meet those needs, thus creating much needed employment in the sector. <clears throat> Mr. President, I now turn my attention to the issue of low productivity. Honorable Senator, let me inform you, you have 15 minutes left. Yes, the issue of low pro productivity. The issue of low productivity seems to be a chronic one in that it, it is less prevalent in the, although it is less prevalent in the private sector, it is an issue nonetheless. The direct correlation between low productivity and the fiscal health of the country cannot be overstated. I noted there are proposals to address this critical area, and I am heartened. However, I would like to state that we can start by ensuring that recruitment of the right talent and ensuring also that there is job fit and empowerment within the public sector can assist with productivity, improvements in productivity. Mr. President, what gets measured gets done, and I believe I may have mentioned that strategy before. We believe uh, performance management is key in ensuring increased productivity. And when we talk about performance management, we're talking about setting smart objectives and smart specific objectives, measurable, attainable, realistic, and objectives that are time bound. Also conducting regular performance reviews, as regular as every quarter, and providing coaching, training, and reward and recognition can improve productivity. Consequence management is important as well when objectives are not met. And of course, Mr. President, this speaks to accountability. Mr. President, on the question of productivity, it would be useful if the report of the Productivity Council would be tabled in this honorable house as there may be proposals in there that may add some value. And um, the leader of government business isn't here, but um, I would like to think that he will give us some information about that in his rebuttal. Mr. President, unemployment continues to plague us. There's a direct correlation between unemployment and the level of crime in the country, or in any country for that matter. It is heartening to learn that our unemployment rate has reduced from 24.1% to 21.6%. However, 
it is of concern that youth unemployment rate is at 43.1% and 21% in terms of overall employment is still considered significantly high. It is hoped that government in its growth strategy will res government's growth strategy, sorry, will result in significant improvements, improvements in this critical area. The Minister of Finance has articulated his first to reduce that rate to 15% in the medium term, and I honestly, and I believe a lot of St. Lucians honestly hope that this objective can be met to inspire some hope to our young people especially. Youth engagement and empowerment are critical in ensuring that we understand the aspirations of the youth and get their buy-in in the job creation thrust. Because the last thing we want is to venture into creating jobs for our youth and at the end of the day, these are not the jobs that they're interested in doing. And again, I assume that some level of analysis has been done to ensure that we understand clearly what is what, what, what we are about to embark on. Mr. President, there's an issue of underemployment. I will not spend a whole lot of time of on, on underemployment. But underemployment speaks to where you have skilled workers in low paying jobs or skilled workers in high, high skilled jobs. And we do have some of that because because of the unemployment situation, people apply for jobs that, you know, that are below their skill set, but they are trying to make ends meet. So it is an area that needs some attention, Mr. President, because of course it has implications for motivation. It has implications for you know, how people um, behave. It has implications for the social and economic situation of the country as a whole. Lack of competitiveness. The decline in the ease of doing business ranking from 34% to 86% tells the world that St. Lucia is not ready to do business, or St. Lucia is a very difficult place to do business. I agree with the Prime Minister when he states in his budget, budget address that we are on the wrong path and need to reverse this trend. <coughs> a country's openness to trade and ease of doing business exerts a powerful impact on economic prosperity. And one of the strategies proposed for achieving sustainable economic growth to, is to attract foreign direct investments through the CIP and the proposed foreign residency program and the like. How can we achieve success in this trust if with the disjointed, ineffective, and bureaucratic system which currently obtains? In that regard, I am hoping to hear some concrete strategies which will be employed to address this critical area, Mr. President. Strategies such as the establishment of a one-stop shop approach in terms of applications for various licenses. Central, centralization of the many fragmented agencies will render the process of doing business much easier, thus attracting more persons to establish businesses, especially micro and small businesses, which by extension will boost employment and generate economic prosperity. The issue of crime, Mr. President, it will be remiss of me if I don't speak about the issue of, of, of crime. Proverbs 16, ch chapter 15, verses 27 to 29, states that idle minds are the devil's workshop. Mr. President, we are witnessing in St. Lucia the escalation of crime, especially heinous crimes. Access to social media has contributed significantly in that regard, and we have we have been witnessing crimes such as cyber crime, and in that space we're talking about identity theft, defamation, uh, you know, cyber robberies, and so on. Efforts aimed at solving crime is applauded. And I am sorry the minister of home affairs isn't here. But I applaud the efforts. However, there is still some work which we must do as a country to curb the situation. Other root cause causes of crime um, need to be examined. We have a situation where we have a degeneration of our core values, uh, Mr. President. We have a degeneration in 
our ethical standing in the country. All these need to be examined to determine how as a nation we can deal with that situation. In the area of high level of public debt and fiscal deficit, Mr. President, fiscal capacity determines a country's ability to finance larger fiscal deficits without jeopardizing macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability. And I am quoting from the World Bank report of 2009. The Mr. President, if a country has adequate fiscal capacity, it can maintain public spending, even adopt fiscal stimulus packages, and consequently be more resilient in the face of economic shock. The last IMF report of 2017 under Article, under Article 4, Consultation on St. Lucia, painted a picture which suggests that we need to be acutely concerned about the state of debt in this country. Indeed, the Social and Economic Review Report and by the admission of the Prime Minister, we are approximately almost $3 billion in debt as of 2016. The situation should be of concern to all citizens, and indeed, I know that it is of concern to many. Of more critical concern is that the level of debt further increased by 2.6% or $75 million for the same period. Mr. President, the level of debt that we're talking about equates to $17,600 of debt for each citizen in this country based on a population of 170,000. So each one of us is burdened by a debt of, of $17,000 in the name. Mr. President, like other St. Lucians, I am concerned that this bill speaks to an expenditure budget of 1.513 billion, which will be funded in part by further borrowings of 342.28 million. Mr. President, when we talk about a debt of $3 billion, sometimes I reflect and sometimes in conversations with, the citizens, with some members of the, citizens, of the citizenry, the question is as what tangible value, value can we attribute to such a large level of fiscal debt? Senator, let me inform you, you have five minutes left in which to complete your presentation. By the government's own account, the road network in the country is in a deplorable state. The health sector is not delivering value to the citizens. We have a number of educated citizens, as we mentioned, who cannot find gainful employment. A number of state-owned properties, namely schools. Um, Mr. President, I move that standing orders be suspended to allow our colleague an additional 10 minutes to complete her presentation. Senator. Senator, the question is, how many minutes are you proposing, sir? Senator, the question is that standing order 45 free be invoked to allow the minister for the, the senator, sorry, for the five minutes in which to complete her presentation. I now put a question, as many as are of that opinion, CI, as many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Thank you, Minister Mr. President. Senator, Thank you have an additional five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Honorable Colleagues. Yes, Mr. President, just to continue the list, the judicial system is understaffed. Our water sector is inadequate. Mr. President, the list goes on and on. A number of statutory bodies have, re statutory bodies have recorded losses as reflected in the, some of the reports that have been tabled here in this Honorable House. There are strategies in the budget to address a number of these issues, and it is hoped that these strategies will bear some fruit. Mr. President, we must, however, conduct a critical and detailed analysis as to how we got where we are and what we need to do to address inherent causes in a sustainable way. Please allow me, Mr. President, to show my perspectives on what could, be attributed, attribu what could have attributed to our current debt plight. 
Low productivity and lack of accountability, and we spoke about performance management systems, no code of ethics and, and, and so on. Ineffective resource allocation, and human and physical. Mr. President, we are aware that there's been a plethora of commissions of inquiry where we expend significant sums of the state funds to find out you know, how or, or, or to determine the level of accountability by successive administrations and nothing has happened. So that contributes as well to the, the debt level. Poor implementation or no implementation, implementation of projects. We have consultancy, report, consultancy reports on shelves that are not being implemented. Um, politically expediency over economic and social expediency, I believe, contribute to a large extent some of the issues that we have that impact our debt levels. Mr. President, there are some strategies on the health and education that I believe will serve us well. So I extend best wishes to the government in terms of the implementation of those strategies such that we can achieve the objectives set. National, insurance, national health insurance is one that is very dear to my heart, so I'm asking the Minister of Health to ensure that this is implemented speedily. In terms of the roads, we do know that we have significant issues with the road network in St. Lucia, and I saw some allocation there to address some of those issues, so I'm heartened by that. This is even more critical, Mr. President, as these days um, St. Lucia has recorded significant growth in the sharing economy. Sharing economy from the perspective that a lot of people book via Airbnb, booking.com, and so on, and they live in all parts of the island. And these people actually access roads, they access services in these communities. And we want to make sure that our product, we want to make sure that the country reflects a level that would ensure comfort by these people such that our reputation will not be at risk through bad publicity and negative reviews. Climate change adaptation, I'm passionate about this one too and I'm heartened about the thrust to ensure that we take this to a new level. However, I'd like to say that water sector reform is very important because as we are, government is proposing to expand uh, by including additional hotel rooms to the extent of 2,000 in the short term, we need to ensure that we have a water supply that supports that thrust, not to mention the electrification of the country to make sure that our electricity company has the capacity to be able to support that thrust. Tax reform, St. Lucia will welcome any reform which will provide them with, self, with some relief and the strategic intent to reform VAT and income tax is welcome. However, there's discomfort around the, the increased fuel tax from 2.5 to 4, and we would welcome some conversation about that. As, as it relates to uh, increased license fee, which was introduced some time ago to achieve the same objectives that that increase seeks to address. Mr. President, on this note, I would like to thank you immensely for your indulgence. I would like to thank honorable members for their support. And I extend best wishes to the government with the implementation of the fiscal and social programs of the country such that we can create much needed value for the citizenry so that we can enjoy a better quality of life in this country. I thank you, Mr. President. Senator Adrian Oje. Senator, you, before you commence,
Very well, Senator. I'll try to be uh, economical, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish to thank you for the privilege of addressing this honorable Senate. My intervention will focus on policy issues and uh, matters of good governance. Specifically, sir, on the business of investment, we understand the heavy reliance on foreign direct investment, FDI, in the government's budget strategy as expressed in the estimates of revenue and expenditure and the Prime Minister's budget address and related presentations. We understand also the need to jumpstart the economy using this particular approach. We understand also that in the short run, foreign direct investment is probably the fastest way to make a major impact on employment and revenue, both of which should have positive fiscal impacts, providing, of course, you can accelerate the implementation process, which continues to be a major hindrance to both the public and the private sector in terms of growth and new investment. However, Mr. President, when foreign direct investment is linked substantially to the sale or transfer of national assets, strategic national assets held in trust by the government of St. Lucia for the people of St. Lucia, uh, including generations yet unborn, I believe there must be a significant and appropriate level of prior consultation and meaningful engagement of citizens and stakeholders to build consensus. That consensus, I believe, is in the long-term political and democratic interest of this country and its leaders, and it should address the quantum of resources which we wish to surrender, and I use the word intentionally, the transfer processes along with the terms and conditions of such transfer, the anticipated benefits, and most importantly, where those benefits will accrue. This requires a clear, level-headed analysis of economic and social costs, and all major projects should, I believe, have this process as part of their gestation, and the discussion should take place in the public domain. It is incumbent on governments, including this one, to observe principles of good governance, and I would like to refer to the Charter of Good Government Principles established by the United Nations, there are five or seven major points that need to be, I think, held in, in mind as we go about the business of the development of this country. Um, the, for reference, so if you wish, I can, I can um, highlight the source. But generally, the principles of good governance are available on the net if you look them up, United Nations Principles of Good Governance. Um, particularly in that regard, my appeal to government is to trust the wisdom of the St. Lucian people. Do not treat them as casual bystanders who are hungry and therefore without principle or dignity. And by your own vigilance and dedication to such principles, do not allow our people to cast themselves. Sometimes we are oft willing to do that, to cast ourselves into the role of adversaries in the development process. Our economy cannot afford this climate of constant warfare. Our democracy cannot tolerate this climate of constant adversarial politics. Mr. President, let me refer briefly to just five of the major principles of good governance. Legitimacy and participation, which means that citizens should have a voice in decision making, either directly or through legitimate intermediate institutions. Shared vision, number two. Leaders and the public must share a broad and long-term perspective on good governance, along with a sense of what is needed for such development. There must be an understanding of the historical, cultural, and social complexities in which that perspective is grounded. Three, responsiveness. Institutions and processes must try to serve all stakeholders and produce results that meet the needs while making the best use of resources. Four, accountability and transparency. Decision makers in government, the private sector, and civil society need to be accountable to the public as well as to institutional stakeholders. Transparency is built on trust and the free flow of information. 
Finally, fairness and equity. Citizens must have the opportunity to maintain and improve their well-being. Development without this is not really development. It is something else. And supporting this must be the principle of the rule of law, that there is a legal framework that is fair and impartially enforced. Mr. President, we are a long-suffering people. We know temperance, we know patience, we know sacrifice. That is the only reason why we do not have anarchy in the streets, given the level of frustration that many St. Lucians are experiencing in their daily lives. How to feed their children, how to pay their cell phone bill, how to pay the electricity bill without prostituting themselves in one way or another. We are long-suffering people, but be warned that while we talk a lot on some things we forgive and some things we forget, we know exactly how to determine the outcome of an upcoming election and how to wait three, four, or five years to bring about that change. It is my view that many elections are lost in the first two years of a new administration. My advice, which I have mentioned before, is not to squander the political capital which the St. Lucian public has invested and reposed in your party. I recall, Mr. President, if you allow me, um, the experience of Sir John Compton, who, upon gaining a one-seat majority, returned to the electorate to ask for more. They gave him exactly the same result and said, work with that. And I believe that St. Lucians are increasingly aware of the power of their franchise and are not prepared to compromise it. So my advice, again, is to invest wisely the political capital which has been given to the government. With regard to um, employment, Mr. President, a major policy objective of this budget, the scourge of unemployment continues to be the number one evil addressing our society, particularly among young people. We know the statistics, 25% roughly on average, 50% roughly on average among young people. In addressing this issue, we must also remember that some of us would like to be more than employees. And when we hear references to jobs, 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 we have to remember that even if we start as employees, working with a business that is not necessarily owned by a St. Lucian, someday we would like to be owners of our own businesses as well. We would not like to be cast in the light forever as employees and to have our patrimony sold in the name of jobs, jobs, and more jobs. Employment is wonderful. Ownership is better. And I believe that is where we should be focusing our long-range strategies to ensure that St. Lucians continue to be masters of their own destinies. In the lead sector of tourism, where much of the foreign direct investment emphasis has been placed in this budget, I would like to mention that we look forward to being the owners of related businesses, service providers, suppliers, subcontractors. We want our government to remember this and to make sure that there is economic space for our businesses our people, young and old, mid-career, entry level, and thereafter, to participate meaningfully in the country's future. In that regard, Mr. President, foreign direct investment policy must anticipate in very specific ways the economic space that is being created and being left for St. Lucian businesses and St. Lucian entrepreneurs. While we are busy creating wonderful projects, we cannot have a business a situation where there is incidental space. Because that incidental space will be occupied by others, we have to make specific provision for the participation of St. Lucians in the development of their country. And what we are having a lot of the time is that because certain sectors are incentivized and certain types of investors are incentivized, their economic leverage is greater than the rank and file citizen, and this should not be a facet of our economic development policy we have to make provision for specific space. So we have to ask ourselves, when will shares be offered to the public? How will local businesses be included? What is the impact on the labor market? These, what is the impact on the banking system? How can reserves and resources within the economy be embraced and be in deliberately included in our foreign, divest, foreign investment strategies? Um, we are seeing a significant, possibly unhealthy, horizontal and vertical integration within the tourism sector in particular. This is very worrisome and needs to be rebalanced. Tourism investment is no longer just about accommodation. 
it is no longer about the provision of room nights. Large tourism investors are also engaged directly in travel, tours, transport, water sports, boating, boutiques, entertainment, horticulture, procurement, distribution, photography, weddings. And the list goes on. And these are areas which used to be specifically reserved for nationals, both formally and informally in legislation, which has become largely, I think, ignored. We have to rebalance this and make sure that when we are encouraging lead sectors like tourism, but there are others, uh, to be major beneficiaries of our incentive and tax policies, that specific space is made available and reserved for national businesses and nationals of this country. We need to create new space for the very people we now see as employees to grow into new roles, not incidentally. We need to have proactive strategies for them to learn and grow and become equity partners in the development of the entire economy. We cannot design an economy or a society where the commanding heights are reserved are, or are not accessible to current and future generations. We understand business is business. We understand cash flow is king. We understand that tourism business needs to diversify its revenue base away from just room revenue. But we also have to make sure that there is economic space for local businesses who do not receive the same level of incentives that others do under the rubric of foreign direct investment. And I would like to suggest, uh, Mr. President, that we pay specific attention as we try to grow the economy to legislation that is clear, easily accessible, and transparent for domestic businesses intending to grow, not just to maintain their current operations, but to grow. And I would ask the leader of government business in this honorable house to consider how we can incentivize established, medium-sized, small businesses who are already on a path how we can incentivize them to accelerate their growth so that they will be well positioned when the turnaround, if the turnaround comes along. Yes, sir. Um, meanwhile, those businesses, those small operators, um, and even large do domestically owned businesses are facing harsh economic environments and they are left to sink or swim in the high waters of competition while we are bending over backwards to accommodate others. I am appealing here, Mr. President, for a review of the incentive regime available to and accessible by small and medium-sized enterprises which are driving or capable of driving growth in this economy. We need to enhance their economic contribution to the recovery and to the tourism sector in particular. In that regard, Mr. President, I would like to mention uh, the draft incentives bill for the creative sector. Madam Minister, I may be able to inform us at some stage that bill was drafted at least two years ago and it has not seen the light of day as far as I am aware. Um, but the creative industries is supposed to be a major policy, a major pillar of the economic strategy, at least it was under the last administration. A lot of money was spent. I'm not sure there's any visible progress to show for it so many years later. And we now need to see where is that incentive bill and how is it going to help to liberate the tremendous potential of the creative sector, which has been languishing um, for some time. And um, we would be aware of recent uprisings in the sector where people objected to having their futures determined outside of themselves. And voices were heard and meetings were convened again on the defensive. A little bit too much of that, I would say. Um, but we need to look at that sector. Moreover, about four years ago, maybe three, um, there was a harmonized incentive regime drafted by CARICOM, proposed to governments, adopted by governments, which looked at a harmonized system of incentives for the creative industries. And as far as I'm aware, this has not seen the light of day either, certainly not in St. Lucia. Um, Mr. President, I would like to also mention that there seems to be a plethora of overlapping agencies in this new dispensation. There are agencies, there are foundations, there are ministries, there are state companies, private companies operating in the creative industries sector, and there is confusion in the institutional landscape. I would like to recommend that mandates be clarified, products and services need to be redefined and redesignated, funding priorities need to be clarified and streamlined, and the training and development agenda in particular needs to be given new emphasis. With regard to the new suite of festivals, 
within festivals, there is urgent need for clarity of product and market. I don't think we have got it right yet, and I would like to recommend a consultation, a broad consultation, to get this thing right, because a lot of small businesses suffered in the months of May and June um, that should have been prospering. The intention is good, but the implementation needs some clarity, and we should not be afraid to say so. Uh, it would be useful for us to also mention here, so the lack of debate in the lower house, Mr. President, I think it is fair to say that a considerable portion of St. Lucians are still waiting for presentations and explanations of details, particularly at ministerial level, regarding the policy and expenditure priorities of the government. And while uh, parties may not feel that they are accountable to each other, we are all accountable to the people of St. Lucia. And uh, this should not be a feature of our small island politics that we omit a debate, a presentation, an explanation of what we are going to do and how we are going to do it so that the people can be engaged in the business of government. We have been left waiting and wanting for this conversation to be initiated by our elected leaders. For many, it is the only substantial interface that they have through radio, television, internet, um, talk on the street corner, thing, debate on the block. This is what the people need. So whether some are here or some are not here, do not fail to tell us what you have in store. In a related question, Mr. President, um, I would like someone to enlighten us on the appointment of members to the Integrity Commission and to the Public Accounts Committee. I believe that some enlightenment would be useful. These are both checks and balances in our democracy, and I have not heard anything to uh, update us on that. Um, on the business of liquidity in the domestic financial system, Mr. President, um, I would like to refer to the uh, comments by my colleague, Independent Senator, and note in that regard that while we are in a tight economic situation, driven largely by fiscal constraints within the public sector, there is something of a dichotomy in our economic profile because there's in fact excess liquidity in the banking system. So there's money in the country. Um, and it li it, it's lying idle for want of better projects. Um, it's at very low interest rates. And it requires a better fiscal environment for it to be deployed. But there is 2% money sitting around in the banking system doing virtually nothing. At any rate, Mr. President, that money belongs largely to St. Lucians, and I would like to stress that we may well have the means to finance some of our recovery, some of our own recovery. Let this be remembered when government is contemplating um, its foreign direct investment, when it is contemplating um, its sale of shares, um, its sale of public assets, and in that regard, I want to mention specifically the banking sector. Government has significant interests there, which may or may not be liquidated. Uh, the private citizens of this country may well be in a position and should not be left out of any share offer. Um, I wish to suggest, Mr. President, even more specifically, that um, the Honorable Leader of Government Business consider convening a domestic growth and investment forum or conference so that both the public sector and the private sector can share information on upcoming projects and objectives, uh, investment, etc. That way we can make sure that public and private sector agendas are compatible and they are mutually supporting and reinforcing. It would not be to anyone's benefit to have government and the private sector investing at cross purposes. So I would like to suggest that, sir. And if there is a, a way to consider the drafting of this growth-oriented incentive regime, which is available particularly to small and medium-scale businesses in our own economy, try and get those businesses moving because the economic landscape is constrained. And I would not like to see a situation where we don't think our own people are capable of financing themselves out of, uh, of economic depression. In reference to my earlier comments on good governance principles, I think that such an approach is is participatory, it breeds transparency, responsiveness, and brings people to the table who may not otherwise have a voice. And to conclude, Mr. President, in pursuit of our own development, while we will also seek the assistance and support of friends and colleagues elsewhere beyond our shores, and we look for bulk responses, 
Um, sometimes we look for elusive messiahs who turn out to be fraudulent, but we must first rely on ourselves and on each other to do for our nation things that we can and must and should do for ourselves if we are to preserve our nation, our sovereignty, and our dignity. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Senator, the Minister for Home Affairs, Justice and National Security. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, um, fellow colleagues. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here this morning, although I'm not feeling 100%, um, um, so I want you to bear with me if I make a few mistakes now and then. But I'd like to thank the Almighty Father for his guidance um, during the past year. I also want to thank the people of, of this country for the in interaction we feel which we have had. The Prime Minister continues to show confidence in my ability to perform in the ministries that I head. And I also want to thank my cabinet colleagues for all the support and encouragement that they have extended to me. It is unfortunate, Mr. President, that I have to start my presentation by referring to the unusual amount of fake news being disseminated on a daily basis. That's what technology does. Eh? That's, that's, what it, that's what it does. Yeah, huh? <laughs> Apparently somebody has hacked into my... <laughs> my apologies. I want to say that the individuals or organizations that take pleasure in perpetuating that activity may believe that they are hurting the United Workers' Party. But let me state categorically that some may affect the party, but invariably it is our beautiful St. Lucia that will bear the brunt of any fallout. The St. Lucia Labor Party is referred to, Mr. President, as the Malawi Party, and it thrives on this nomenclature. It is therefore necessary for the Labour Party to oppose any sort of development which may change the plight of the so-called Malawi. <laughs> Mr. President, we must never forget in our history that it was the Honourable Kenny Anthony, Prime Minister at the time, who said that he was going to write to investors, for investors, not to invest in this country. This Labour Party has always been pregnant with opportunities and plans for St. Lucia when they're in opposition. But when in government, they cannot deliver. And like the Prime Minister um, said, they seem to have what you call labour pains. I just want to give you just a few names. Um, are the projects that they attended to, attempted to do, but were unsuccessful. The Black Bay development, the Sabwisha development, DSH, and yes, DSH. Mr. President, all members of the, of the opposition are all full of sound and fury, but then signifies nothing. When you had a leader of the opposition, the member for Castry South, and of course the member from Labry, we understand how angry and empty they sound. 
They portray themselves, Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, as bastions of morality and honesty. But time, I can assure you, will inform us soon enough. Let's look at the history of the Labour Party when it comes to the development of our country. There are some of the developments implemented by the United Workers' Party that were opposed by the St. Lucia Labour Party. And I just name a few. The Hess development in Col de Sac, the Marina at Grosile, the Causeway at Pigeon Point, the John Compton Dam, the San Susi Housing Development, the Ronora International Airport Development, the Cassius Redevelopment Project, and the Point Seraphine Development. <laughs> With the first five mentioned programs, Mr. Speaker, the government at the time remained resolute and the fruits of those projects are now being enjoyed. I can inform you that like Sir John Compton, when he moved with alacrity, this government will not be deterred from our development programs. Mr. President, juxtapose the above mentioned initiatives and the actions of the Labour Party when in government. Rochomel, Greinberg, Le Paradis, Fenrel, cost of a run on the highway from Viewfort to Sufre, the Lombards, by the way, thank you, um, colleague. The government has spent over $2,200,000 on students, the Lombard students. Thanks to our present DPP, we were able to deal with this matter in a manner where the students were able to be compensated. I am adamant that the former Minister of Commerce must be made to compensate the country for the money spent on taking care of the students. It must be remembered that a senior officer who was leading the investigations at the time was unceremoniously removed from the investigations and transferred. What do you call that sort of behavior by a government? Mr. President, I am presently studying a case in one of our Caribbean countries where the Privy Council has stated that the Attorney General of a country can take action in tort against former ministers of government who caused the state to spend money uselessly to recover that amount. The former Minister of Commerce and the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, should take note. Mr. President, they describe persons who oppose them with names like media terrorists, Chuzusu, the most frightening development in the politics of this country. Today, they embrace the once frightening individual as the best thing to happen to St. Lucia. This is the modus operandi of the Labour Party, Mr. President. They know how to oppose. And I would like to advise the people of this nation to keep them in their comfort zone. <laughs> this is where they perform. That's right. Mr. President, we talk about victimization, but it appears that they have very short memories. As a member of the Labour Party, I was made Chairman of Sports Incorporated. I worked hard without any remuneration. But as soon as I decided to join the United Workers' Party, I was immediately dismissed, along with other members perceived to be flower supporters. The workers of the Castro City Council were dismissed because they were perceived to be flower supporters. The Labour Party, when in power, sidelined career civil servants and brought in the chosen permanent secretaries. Lately, one of those chosen permanent secretaries have decided to take the, the government to court. He was taken out as cabinet secretary and sent to the Ministry of Labor. No pun intended, Mr. President. Today, he is taking the government to court. And we need to ask the question. <laughs> But we need to ask the question, was he given tenure of, of office as a cabinet sec? Again, technology is, 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 is um, forsaking me, Mr. President. It is a disgrace, Mr. President, to the intelligence of the populace when a sitting parliamentarian and no lesser person than the leader of the opposition can stand in our house and say to the world that the United Workers Party promised the police that they would make the impacts report disappear. 
But looking at the estimates of expenditure of 2016-2018, we will see in page 447, recurrent expenditure, grants and contributions. You will see that the impacts is a regional organization where a sum of $266,251 is made to that institution. On page 449, Mr. President, you would also see the regional security system which is given $2,551,349. So this is just a regional institution and the government is duty bound to deal with it. IMPACTS is a regional entity. The acronym IMPACTS means Implementation Agency for Crime and Security. And it is similar to other regional entities like the University of the West Indies and sub-regional entities like the RSS. Mr. President, a few weeks ago, the Honorable Prime Minister presented his budget with a deficit budget. It is important to know that all cabinet ministers, when discussing that budget, had to take a cut. The Ministry of Home Affairs, Justice, and National Security were not spared. I will be having discussions with the head of the department to formulate strategies as to how we would be able to deal with the amount of finance that was given to us. Mr. President, during the last election, one of the most dominant issues was the impact report. This report was prepared by officers appointed by the director of impacts, Mr. Francis Forbes. That report was handed directly, Mr. President, to the Honorable Prime Minister, Kenny Anthony. And as I have indicated previously, that this government, forget about what he did, but this government has to deal with this issue. As a consequence, we appointed a director of public prosecutions and a deputy director. There were persons who questioned the appointment of the DPP on a one-year contract. But this was a mutually agreed contract, and we expect that at the end of the first year, renegotiations will take place, Mr. President. We also want to inform the public that the independence of the DPP is absolute. Understandably, there will be discussions between my office and that of the DPP on administrative issues. I will not get personally involved in the day-to-day -day running of the DPP's office. Neither will I attempt to nudge him in any particular direction. I know that all parties involved in the impacts report are anxious for closure. So I implore my people, Mr. President, to give the DPP the time he needs to make the correct and proper decision. I now move on to, the, to deal with the departments of which I have superintendents over. The Fire Service Department. These men and women, Mr. President, have been performing their duties under heart wrenching conditions. I want to thank those officers for their invaluable service to the country. In my discussions with the hierarchy and the Welfare Association, there is a distinct belief that they have been treated as second-class citizens when you compare them with the police and the prisons. These officers risk their lives every day to attend to fires and accident scenes. There is no major changes in the service from time immemorial, and these changes have to be made now. And I intend, uh, Mr. Speak, Mr. President, to do just that. In that, my, in that regard, my department will, wo will work with the Honorable Attorney General to look at the Fire Service Act to make the necessary changes that reflect a modern fire service. Mr. President, some of the burning issues, again, no pun intended, are as follows, promotions. We are looking forward in developing a promotion policy similar to that of the police. I have indicated that the imbalance in the hierarchy of the fire service must change. There are too many male persons dominating the hierarchy of the, of the fire service. And I want to make it look, it has to be more transparent, 
and more representative, similar to what happens in the police force and at the prisons. We will look at the standing operation um, procedures. We look at staffing issues. Um, we just recruited 40 officers um, last November, but these 40 officers were just there for replacement. So they really don't have the numbers that we are looking at. So we are looking to see where we can recruit a few more of those officers. Policy on driving um, with the fire service. I know this is a specialist area. Persons drive the ambulance. They have to drive at excessive speeds. They have to go in and be in between um, traffic. And all that causes problems to them. I'm sure that we will remember the incident where a young man lost his life because of an accident with a fire appliance. Unfortunately, the police has had to charge him from motor manslaughter. We need, to get, we need to look at the conditions of the fire stations. We are in the process of looking for a, lo a location in within Cassius so we can build a new fire headquarters for those officers. We want to reinstitute grading, Mr. President. That means you enter the police for the fire service, and after five years, you can get a, an increase in your salary as a senior fireman. Or, um, because when you just join and you're two years service, you get the same amount of money with an officer who's been there for 10 years who hasn't been promoted. And I think that is unfair. We have to look at the security of the stations. And our, our minister is not here. But I'm, happy that I, I'm sure that you would be happy to, to know that the Babano Fire Station will be um, commissioned in the very near future. The Prime Minister in his budget made an allocation of $1.9 million um, to purchase an amb ambulances and fire trucks. So this opening will be done this year. In November of 2015, Mr. President, a team of consultants visited St. Lucia and to review the fire service. There are a number of recommendations were made, namely one, the fire service to be classified as essential service within the meaning of the labor code. So what we saw before, um, this wildcat strikes and, and so on, will be something of the past. Recruit and train retired fire officers local to the fire stations to support and augment full-time professional staff. Again, the staff members at the, at the stations, different stations, are not sufficient, and if there is a fire, these, these trained officers can come in and support and will be paid every time that they assist. The Public Service Commission will delegate authority for discipline and grievances to the fire chief, similar again to what the, the Commissioner of Police has. The commissioner has powers of discipline and promotion from the rank of constable to inspector. The fire chief has nothing like that. He doesn't hire, he can't fire, he can't discipline, he can't do anything. And so we, we realize that there's a lot of indiscipline within the organization, and I'll be looking forward for the Public Service Commission to give some of that power to the fire chief. At this juncture, I must thank and officially congratulate Mrs. Um, Cheryl Francis, who is our consulate in, in Canada, for the amount of work that she has been doing in that regard, looking for all sorts of stuff for the fire service, the police, and uh, Bonnelly. Bonnelly correction, again, I think that the management of the facility must be commended and congratulated for the manner in which they have been able to deal with the myriad of issues which confront them on a daily basis. Some of those issues are overcrowding, illicit drugs, staffing issues, transportation, a dilapidated kitchen, etc. Mr. President, despite those challenges, the management team and officers have been able to keep peace and tranquility at the facility. A number of social activities have been organized and successfully implemented. And I'm sure that my colleague here, um, independent senator, and Mrs. Mrs. Francis, will be happy to hear that. Some of the ongoing education programs are literary nights, football competition, and a family day. The management will be looking to acquire some more land to augment what they are doing on the present farm project. We would like to encourage the team to continue the good work. Mr. President, the budget makes provision for, for the facility to get a few vehicles, at least three, 14 seaters to, to transport their staff. 
Um, we're also looking at overseas training for some of the senior officers. That has started, but we want to continue a little further. The Royal St. Lucia Police Force. Mr. President, I can remember in the year 2002, as the acting commissioner of police with responsibility for crime, I wrote an article in the Police Week magazine, and I was only reading it yesterday, and it sound, sounded like I wrote it yesterday. So with your indulgence, and I can always make the, the document, uh, document of the house, that I can be given an opportunity to read it so that you see how relevant it is even now. And I said in Emil Durkheim's classical study on crime, he states that crime is both functional and inevitable. He goes further to indicate that crime becomes dysfunction dysfunctional when incidents of crime are either too high or too low. Dukhaim never offered any reasons for the causes of crime, but he did talk about punishment, which in his opinion must be swift, appropriate, and the individual should be fully aware of the reasons for imposing that punishment. Dukhaim seems to be suggesting that there will always be a level of criminal criminality within our society, and our approach to controlling it will be of paramount importance. Abraham Lincoln has been credited by saying, in order to know where we are going, we have to know where we've been. From time immemorial, the police force has been tasked with the responsibility of maintaining law and order in our society. In the past, we were understaffed, inadequately, inadequately trained, and extremely short on equipment. Thankfully today, I can say that some of those ills have been addressed by the government, but we have a long way to go. In the old days, although police suffered from the aforementioned difficulties, they had one important asset, which was public support, an asset which today public officers do not enjoy. Many reasons have been forwarded as to why it is so. I do not intend to dwell on those reasons, but to look at what is needed to rescue our society from the effects of criminal activity. The Commissioner, Gazette Officers, and the Community Relations Branch are working assiduously to improve the relationship between the police and the public. The basic mission of the police is the prevention of crime. But when it occurs, there is need for the police and the community to work in partnership. The community needs to remember that the police are the people, and the people are the police. Every law-abiding citizen should embrace the idea of a partnership. The police are the ones paid full-time to do what is incumbent on every law-abiding citizen, as crime prevention is everyone's business. In the old days, the quotation from the Bible, which implores us to be our brother's keeper, was practice, and people looked out for each other's property and were very willing to inform others as to who interfered with their property. The real test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder, not the visible evidence of the police action in dealing with them. The police needs to be more practical. Police officers must at all times share knowledge and resources with other police officers and the general public. The police must learn that crime prevention means more than locks, lights, and alarms. Community-based programs need to take precedence. George Bernard Shaw summed up his feelings about community involvement by saying, I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch which I've got to hold up for the moment. And I want to make it burn brightly as possible before handing on to future generations." Unquote. Therefore, my advice to police officers is to remember that our duty to serve mankind, safeguard life and property, protect the innocent against deception, the weak against oppression or intimidation, and the peaceful against violence or disorder. We need to respect the constitutional rights of all citizens for liberty, equality, and justice. We must enforce the laws continuously and appropriately without fear or favor, malice or ill will, never employing unnecessary force or violence. We need to recognize our badge of office as a symbol of public faith. We should accept it as a public trust to keep as long as we are true to the ethics 
of our, uh, our, our organization. The crime problem that we are presently experiencing can be brought under control if we embrace this idea of a partnership. We in the force know that there are problems, but these can only be fully, fully addressed if we get the help that is needed from the general public. There will be hope if that partnership is allowed to develop. 2002, sounds like only yesterday that it was written. Mr. President, I want to start with the police by congratulating Superintendent Ronald Phillips, who was awarded the prestigious accolade at the Conference of Commissioners of Police as being the officer with the best academic achievement for the year. I also want to congratulate Corporal Alvin Prosper for being awarded the second prize for intelligence as an intelligence officer in the Caribbean. So it tells us that we have the capacity and capability within our police force, but we have to give them the sort of support that they need. Mr. President, the safety of our citizens and visitors is paramount duty of our department. But this organization has been on the sword for a while, Mr. President. The emergence of the impact report has, which was commissioned by the St. Lucia Labour Party, and the circumstances have been having a very dire toll on our officers. We expect that this issue will be dealt with expeditiously as possible. As a consequence of the impacts report, members of the force have, been, have not been as confident in their ability to perform in an atmosphere of mistrust. Against this background, Mr. President, I must publicly thank the hierarchy and file of rank and file of the police force for the invaluable work that they have been performing. They have been denied a lot of training because of the Leahy law, which prevents the U.S. government from giving them the necessary assistance. Other countries have recognized the plight and have come in to assist, and we thank them for that. During last week, Mr. President, we did have discussions with the European government and told them exactly what the government was doing with respect to the impacts report. And I think that they didn't, they, they were satisfied that the police are actually doing what they're supposed to do. The Constitution of St. Lucia, um, Mr. President, I'm trying to get my, my Constitution. Yeah. Yes, sir, why are you doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, oh, this is it. Yeah, no, it's Page 8 of the Constitution, Paragraph 2. Protection of life and property, a right of, to life and property. A person shall not be deprived of his life intentionally, save in execution of the sentence of a court in respect of a criminal offense under any law of which he has been convicted. A person shall not be regarded as having been deprived of his life in contravention of this section if he dies as a result of the use to such an extent and under such circumstances as permitted by law of such force as is reasonably necessary. And it gives you the reasons when you can use force. A, for the defense of any person from violence or for the defense of property. B, in order to effect a lawful arrest or to prevent the escape, and to prevent the escape of a person lawfully detained. C, for the purpose of suppressing a riot, insurrection, or mutiny. Or D, in order to prevent the commission by that person of a criminal offense, or if he dies as a result of a lawful act of the law. There is always a right and wrong way to execute your duties, Mr. President. But my advice to the police officers is to follow the proper procedure and establish protocols and the actions will be justified. The rule of law must always be paramount in our minds. The rights of the individuals must always, and I insist, must always be respected, Mr. Pre Mr. President, regardless of creed, color, religion, belief, or political affiliation. 
The government is in the process of dealing with the following initiatives. One, the OECS Court of Appeal headquarters. And I'm sure that's, that's, that's music to your ears, Mr. President. Two, the temporary Court of Justice building, which is causing a firestorm. But I, I suspect my friend next to me will explain a little more when she comes to the culture um, aspect of, of removing the, the cultural center and placing a temporary Court of Justice in that area. The forensic lab, as we know, has reopened partially. Um, the Prime Minister has promised me that he's going to get some money for me so that I can rebuild and to open it fully by the end of this year. There's also a project on with the OECS government in looking at the lab in, in Antigua and partnering with the lab in Antigua. So we will be doing some of the anal an analytical work and the lab in, in, in Antigua will be doing some. So it's going to be an OECS and a regional lab. So this is good news for us. The training of senior officers, they have missed that sort of training. And so we're looking to make sure that they can do that. And that includes having exchanges. So our senior officers will go to Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and spend some time with the senior officers there, seeing how things are, are being done. So when they come back, they would like to go there. We also are now looking at border control, um, which is going to encompass the immigration department, the marine unit, the quarantine division of the Ministry of Agriculture, and I think the marine and customs. But I just want to refer, um, Mr. Speaker, to the statement by the Prime Ministers in his budget, which can be found on page 28. Improving security and justice. Madam Speaker, this government will work to improve the administration of justice and the security of our country, St. Lucia. St. Lucia courts have been without a home for some time, which has resulted in delays in the hearing of cases and the rising demand, remand population in the prisons. And continues on page 29. The courts will be temporarily re relocated to the grounds of the National Cultural Center. A temporary structure will be erected to house the family court, first district court, the high court, magistrate's court, and the offices of the director of public prosecutions, while the National Cultural Center will be re relocated to an alternative location. And we are in the process of discussing that location. Mr. Madam Speaker, the office of the director of public prosecutions has been short on resources for some time. This has hindered the pace at which cases can be handled. We will strengthen the office of the Director of Public Prosecutions through adequate staffing and the provisions of other enabling services as proper equipment. This will further assist with the reduction of the backlog in faces. Madam Speaker, we can report that with the appointment of the new DPP, sufficient progress, significant progress has already been made in reducing the backlog of cases. And I would like to publicly congratulate him and his department on the success thus far. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to report the forensic lab reopened during the financial year. We expect this to assist the Royal St. Lucia Police Force in their crime fighting efforts. In addition, we will increase the resources of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force by training 46 recruits and providing additional vehicles and other much needed equipment. We cannot keep expecting our police to perform better if we do not give them the necessary support and tools to perform. Madam Speaker, through our intelligence-driven crime-fighting strategies, we aim to increase surveillance within the city of Cassis with the installation of CCTV cameras throughout the city, particularly in areas prone to crime. The government will be partnering for private sector in the supply and maintenance of cameras. Madam Speaker, there is need to improve organizational effectiveness within the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. A number of senior officers have retired and it is the intention of my government to establish a leadership training program to ensure proper succession plan and to provide effective leadership at all levels of the force. Our government is committed to ensuring that officers are kept abreast of new and advanced crime fighting techniques. Honorable Minister Ledman, for me, you have 15 minutes left. I should be finished. Thanks. Strengthening border control. Madam Speaker, permit me to turn my attention to the issue of security at our air, air and seaports. At present, four agencies perform border 
management functions in St. Lucia. These are Customs and Excise Department, Immigration Department, Marine Unit, and the Quarantine Division of the Department of Agriculture. Agriculture. Collectively, these agencies have responsibility for overseeing the movement of people, animals, and plants, the imports and exports of goods and services, and the securing of St. Lucia borders. Madam Speaker, these agencies are facing elevated security threats, increased global trade and scarcity of resources. Other challenges include archaic data storage and retrieval practices, inadequate sharing of information, non-transparent legislation and increased procedural requirements as well as a greater demand against debt resources due to increased travel and trade into and out of St. Lucia. These factors have placed an immense burden on these agencies and on resources of the government of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, there is need to rethink our approach to securing our borders, which would bring about greater efficiency and effectiveness in the dispensation of border control and management. To this end, we will develop a border control service. This agency will be responsible for border management and the processing of people, goods, plants, and animals at all ports of entry, customs and immigration services, enforcement of relevant le legislation, protection of St. Lucia's borders. Madam Speaker, we expect that the formation of one agency with, responsi with responsibility for border management will correct many of the existing efficiencies. To this end, the committee has been set up with representatives from key agencies to examine the options for the establishment of a border control service. Mr. Speaker, there is only, Mr. President, there is only one more thing that I would like to talk about, and that is the Cannabis Committee, which was set up, and they are working. Um, so by year end, we will be getting a report as to the pros and cons of um, that development. In conclusion, Mr. President, I want to inform the opposition that we live in a democracy. And the words that you use in public domain may be such that you do not, con that you do not convey or allow for interpretation by the general public that will come back to haunt you. As the Minister with Responsibility for Peace and Tranquility in this country, I can promise that the law and order will be maintained at all times. Thank you. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to adjourn the Senate for one hour so that members can have lunch. So we should be back here by 2.35 p.m. Senators, the question is that the sitting of the Senate be suspended until 2, suspended until 2.45. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion say I, as many as of a country opinion say no, I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Senate suspended until 2.45. And this concludes the morning session of the Upper House of Parliament of St. Lucia, which we more commonly know as the Senate. The bill before the house the motion that is on the floor um, is actually the appropriations bill 2017 2018 so far we have speakers in the persons of the leader of government business and minister in the ministry of finance honorable dr ubaldus raymond who presented the bill before the house and uh, he was followed by independent senator honorable mauricia thomas francis and then Honorable Adrian Auger, who is also an independent senator. We just heard from Honorable Herman Gil Francis, who is the Minister for Home Affairs, Justice, and National Security. He spoke on the reforms uh, for the fire service, the proposed reforms for the fire service, and also to the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and the judiciary system. We do expect uh, quite a few more contributions this afternoon, so please stay with us. We'll only be gone for about an hour. We are to resume at 2.35 p.m., as indicated by the President of the Senate, Honorable Andy Daniel. So please stay tuned to the National Television Network. Thank you.